One question is, we, and all these pictures, we've drawn these convergence dynamics, right? We've drawn this dynamics of you converge to the steady state. What determines, let's say in terms of a half-life, how quickly you get to the steady state? What would be the most important? Did we talk about this? I don't think we did, did we? What are the most important determinants of how fast you approach the steady state? What? Not, it's, yeah, I would measure it by like the half like How many years it takes me to get halfway to the steady state? Because for models like this, they kind of have this exponential convergence where the half, there's like a half-life. Yeah. It is. It is. That's, that's, general, that's why you can talk about it as a half-life. It doesn't matter how, like if this is a linear model, it doesn't matter how far away I am, I'm going to close half the gap at some rate. Well, actually, the interest rate doesn't matter too much. The biggest one, depreciation rate, hugely important. Because depreciation rate is how fast, if you had a non-economic model, if you had a model in which I was constant, that is, there was no response of I to, to the market, you would converge at delta. Delta would be the convergence rate. Because you would just, you know, the, it's, the only effect is on depreciation. And the farther you are away, that's how much less depreciation you are. You get exactly delta would be the depreciate would be the convergence rate. Right? You're right? Because it's an equation. It's like k dot equals minus delta k plus i. Well, everybody knows, I mean, how do you solve that? That that is a linear differential equation that has a solution that has like e to the minus delta t as the, as the solution. So it's going to converge at rate delta. So delta is an important determinant right off the bat. But what else? It is really simple. The answers are actually really simple. OK. Yeah. More elasticity of supply. Absolutely. Faster. Right? The faster. That's an important determinant, too. That's really important. I might even say that's more important than delta. Delta is like a lower bound convergence rate, right? Even if you had zero supply elasticity, you'd converge at rate delta, right? What else? Well, we already got the supply elasticity up there, guys. What do you think the other one has to be if it ain't the supply elasticity? It's got to be the demand elasticity, right? And less elastic demand is going to mean faster. Should have guessed that even without thinking, because if more elastic supply, well, it doesn't always go that way, but that's probably a good guess. But why? Well, if demand is less elastic, then when you reduce the stock, rents go up even more. If rents go up more, then prices go up more. And if prices go up more, you're going to converge faster. Right? And in simple models, it's actually the ratio of elasticity of supply to the elasticity of demand is what shows up. Okay, it's the ratio of those two elasticities. Okay? So those are the key factors. Now the interest rate is kind of interesting. The way that remember when I talked before about this anticipated increase in demand? And I mentioned that, well, you don't in the way I did the equilibrium. You built some of that demand in advance, and you didn't, and you built some afterward, right? We didn't completely satisfy the new level of demand. We didn't get to the steady state, even if we learned like a thousand years in advance, right? Even if we learned that demand was going to go up in 2006, a thousand years earlier, we still wouldn't build the new steady state stock by 2006. And indeed, in these simple models, you never even build half of it. You build a little bit less than half, and the, the interest rate would actually determine how much you built in advance versus how much you built afterward. And there's an easy way to think about it, and it's like this. Look, what you'd like to do if you had perfectly elastic supply would do what? Well, you just maintain the old steady state until you got to 2006. You just build a whole ton of stuff on 2006, and then you'd satisfy the new level of demand. Now, if you can't build perfectly elastic, then you have to spread that out. 
There's a cost to spreading it out too early because you're building houses you don't really need. And there's a cost to waiting too late because now you're not satisfying the new level of demand. And what usually happens in economics happens in this case. You kind of share the pain. You do some too early and some too late. Now the interest rate comes in because doing stuff too early happens earlier in time. Doing stuff too late happens later in time. And the interest rate determines the rate at which I'm willing to trade those two things off against each other. So if there was a zero interest rate, you'd kind of like want to do half your pain beforehand and half your pain afterward. But if you got a positive interest rate, you're going to say, well, I'd just rather suffer a little more after the fact than before the fact, and you kind of don't get halfway there by the time. So that's kind of how it works. The interest rate is the biggest role to think about it is its biggest role is determining the importance of the future versus the past. When the interest rate is low, the future is almost as important as the past. When the interest rate is very high, the past is much more important than the future. That's really what happens. Now, if you, if you think about this from a mathematical standpoint, it's, it always works out that way because you're gonna, if you look at the roots of these differential equations, they sum to R. So, and the one that goes forward is, is a bigger in magnitude than the one that goes backwards, but they're, because they sum to R, the positive one is, is like, what is it, 2R bigger than the small one or whatever. I can't remember, you have to solve it out, but th that's how it works.